Hello and welcome to the summer holiday special of A Pod About A Pod. What's that mean? Well, this episode was initially scheduled for Father's Day, and for good reason. The show I'm talking about today is an excellent podcast for dads. I should know, because I'm a dad. That's not true, I'm just kidding. But I do have a dad, and I suggested he listen to Podcast X, and he loved it. In fact, you'll want to stay tuned to the last segment on today's show, The Peanut Gallery, because I'm going to be interviewing my dad about his thoughts on the show. That being said, today, the day of my recording, is actually the 4th of July, so this episode did take a while longer to produce than I initially suspected. However, that's okay because dads and patriots alike will adore today's podcast X. By the way, if you're new to a pod about a pod, this is a podcast about podcasts featuring commentary, critique, and sneak peeks of a different show every episode in my quest to share the best of podcasts. I'm your host, Jordan Pierce, and today, maybe more so than ever, I expect to deliver on that promise. So, without further ado, today's APAAP is all about SYSK, which stands for Stuff You Should Know, a charming encyclopedia of a podcast offering a vast multiplicity of things worth learning. Here's what you should know about what to expect. Chuck and Josh are two old white dudes who are going to learn you a thing or two. This is probably the most enjoyable mansplaining podcast out there, perhaps with the exception to the one you're listening to right now. All kidding aside, Stuff You Should Know takes complex, often mysterious topics and converts them into digestible, comprehensive episodes which typically clock in at around a half hour to a full hour long. The show also features short stuff episodes for topics that don't justify the usual length. On the flip side of that, there are occasional two-parter episodes for topics that have too much good information to squeeze into a single full-length upload. That being said, various of these episodes happen to be recorded live, and the subject range is really vast. I mean, their catalog is nearing 1,500 episodes at this point. I'm sorry. Yeah, I said that right. 1,500 episodes. So think about the range and breadth and depth that they have covered in that time. The subjects range from historical events and important people to scientific phenomenon and true crime, as well as nearly anything you could think of in between. Stuff You Should Know is best known for the balance they strike between entertaining and informative. They've concocted the special cocktail of professionalism and personability that is perfect for the podcasting platform. Here is a taste of the magic Chuck and Josh make in your first sneak peek, where they discuss how lightning works. All right, so Chuck, let's talk lightning, shall we? Sure. You got your Statman role. Did you read that one thing, the NASA article? There's some stats in there that I thought you'd just have a bonanza with. I didn't get to it. Oh, buddy. All right, I'll play the stat man role then. Okay. Because there, there were some good stats in there. Do you want me to start out with a few? Sure. Chuck. I got a few, too. Between, let's tag it. Between uh, this one study of lightning strikes between 1959 and 1994, found that... Let's see, 9,818 people were struck by lightning in that time. Wow. 3,239 died. 20% died immediately. Like, it was like, you were just struck by lightning, you're over. Yeah. Um, that, that's that got to be like a direct strike, right? All of them are direct strikes. Oh, really? As far as I understand, yes. These okay. were all direct strikes. Like, you can be struck directly, like uh, um, Ranger Roy. Yeah, yeah. And he survived. Um Men are four times likelier than women to be struck by lightning. Okay. Um, the two-thirds of lightning casualties occur between 12 p.m. and 4 p.m., with the maximum at 4 p.m. Yes. Uh, most of the most lightning casualties happen on a Sunday, or with and Wednesday is the second most frequent day. And then July is the peak month. Florida is the state that has the most reported lightning strikes for people. So, if it's 4 p.m. on a Wednesday mm -hmm. in July, and you're in Florida, and you're a man holding, like, a golf club, <laughs> yeah. just kiss your butt goodbye. <laughs> 
I know I already said this, but I'm going to say it again. With a catalog with upwards of 1,500 uploads currently as of this recording, if there's something random you're curious about, like Blood Types or Amelia Earhart or The Enlightenment or Friday the 13th, with episodes entitled, Is Fructose Corn Syrup Bad For You? And What's The Deal With Accents? There's something for everyone. The podcast uploads tri-weekly with new episodes releasing every Tuesday and Thursday with a re-release of an older episode known as an SYSK Select happening on Saturdays. HowStuffWorks.com launched Podcast X on April 17th of 2008. The episodes began very short in length, under 10 minutes apiece, which I think is adorable because it's literally like SYSK is a little baby podcast. At first, it was a rotation of various editors from the website, with Charles W. Chuck Bryant making his debut on May 13th of 2008 and becoming the permanent co-host on July 15th of 2008. I'm sorry that I called it 2008. It's 2020. Who's not used to saying that? The podcast, which was named Stuff You Should Know by Josh, began as an attempt to repurpose some of the articles on HowStuffWorks.com. The podcast has steadily grown in popularity since it began and is consistently in the top 10 on iTunes as one of the most downloaded shows every month. Here's another sneak peek to help you see why, and I stuck it right here in quick history simply because there was no other place to put it neatly, and they're talking about the history of the invention of the scientific method, which is good enough for me. Here it is. The Renaissance came about in the 12th century, and uh, people woke up and saw some of the work in the Islamic world and said, you know what, maybe let's start reading up on Aristotle and Ptolemy and Euclid once again. Yeah, they're like, we forgot about these guys. Yeah, I mean, it literally kind of vanished for a while. It did from the West. Yes. Fortunately, it was still around, you know, in, in its home places. But yes, in the West, they were lost. The Roman stuff was almost entirely lost because it was being suppressed by the locals. And I think the Greek knowledge was completely vanished. Yes, somehow somehow they got it. There was some, um, we got another listener mail after the Enlightenment one. They said that it was a, a an Islamic scholar who was the one who translated Aristotle oh, right. into Latin or something like wow. that. And that without this guy, like the West wouldn't have had much to start with because that's where that birth of rationalism came th from was this rediscovery of uh, Greek and Roman classical thought. Yeah. And this was the basis of scientific inquiry, of rationalism, of saying like, okay, there's there's set rules to things, and we need to discover these rules and how the the principles of how the universe works. Like there has to be principles, and we need to find this in a rational, methodical way. Yeah. And right out of the gate, Europe said, oh, okay, well, whatever you say is right, then Aristotle. Right. <laughs> We're used to just believing everything without questioning it. Yeah. And luckily, Albert Magnus, I think, is who it was. Um, Albertus. Was, was it Albertus? Magnus? Magnus yeah. or Roger Bacon, who said, no, it was Bacon. Roger Bacon, who just has this great name, Raj Bacon. The Bacon brothers? Yeah. He <laughs> Francis said, and Roger? Right. Well, they weren't brothers, though. But they, were they related at all? You know, I looked that up, and I don't think people know either way. I don't think there's any proof, but yeah. a lot of people think because of their names and the way things went back then that they may very well have been related. Yeah. And I mean, they were separated by 300 or so years. Although Roger was a was a monk, so he would not have had children. So if they were oh, related, it's it, an excellent point. It wasn't necessarily through his line. Gotcha. You know. Yeah, he could have been a nephew or something. Yeah, or his brother Kevin might have had <laughs> the the line that matched. So Roger was the one who said, uh, "Everybody, stop! Just because Aristotle wrote something doesn't mean it's fact, especially when we find contradictions to it." Yeah, it doesn't. Aristotle's not automatically right. And this is a huge advancement. Yeah, and uh, Albertus Magnus was the one, I believe, who said, uh, you know, this thing called revealed truth, which is basically God says this instead of a truth found by experimenting. Right. Is maybe we should experiment instead and not take this revealed truth as the truth. Right. And we mentioned in the uh, Enlightenment episode as well about scholasticism, about using scientific inquiry to explain theology. Right. Which was, you know, you're still working from a theological standpoint, right. but you're starting to use scientific inquiry. And the the idea that you shouldn't just accept things as truth, that was, again, a huge, huge breakthrough. Yeah. 
On January 19th of 2013, a television show based on Stuff You Should Know aired on the Science Channel and ran for one season. On April 1st of 2017 is when the podcast started re-releasing some of their older episodes under the SYSK Selects uh, banner on Saturdays. And they reached episode 1000 on October 26th of 2017, making it the largest catalog to date to be featured here at A Pod About A Pod. Their 420th episode was on medical marijuana, although this was reportedly a coincidence. Hmm... Lastly, in quick history, SYSK has some exciting news coming up in the fall. The show is releasing their first book, which is called Stuff You Should Know, colon, an incomplete compendium of mostly interesting things. It would make a great Christmas gift for me. <clears throat> Just saying. Sounds like I need to clear my throat, so I'm going to take a quick break and get hydrated, and then APAAP will be right back with Meet the Talent. Chuck started working at HowStuffWorks.com about a month after Josh, and they became fast friends within the week. Charles Wayne Bryant is always introduced on the show as Charles W. Chuck Bryant, but my favorite is when Josh calls him Chuckers. Born March 15th, 1971, Chuck is a fellow Pisces and was raised Baptist, although his constant struggle with his religious upbringing has been well documented over the years. It's something that he shared about in certain episodes pertaining to religion in one way or another, and it's that kind of personal vulnerability that I feel like makes him special as a host. He grew up in Del Cap County, Georgia, but his family lived in rural Mississippi since the dawn of time, according to him. Chuckers attended an elementary school where his father was the principal and graduated from Radon High School. His mother, Diane, was also a teacher, and he has a brother named Scott, which one of the running jokes of the show is that Scott is better looking than Chuck and kind of better at everything else in life somehow, but I find that hard to believe because I don't think it gets any better than Chuck. In fact, I think Scott lives in Chuck's shadow, and this joke is just to compensate, make Scott feel a little bit better. That's my theory. Either way, Scott is three years older than Chuck, and he also has a sister who is six years older and a brother-in-law who is a Marine Corps general. His uncle, Ed Bryant, is a former Republican member of the U.S. House of Representatives from Tennessee. Pretty interesting fun fact there. Chuck went to college at the University of Georgia where he studied English. That's another thing he and I have in common. I'm studying literature and writing studies as of right now, getting my bachelor's. After college, he took classes in screenwriting at New York University's film school and then moved to Los Angeles for four years. He's also lived in New Jersey. Chuck is married to Emily Senebogen, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, and in 2015, the couple adopted a daughter, Ruby Rose, who happens to share the same birthday as Josh Clark. As a self-described crazy animal person, he has multiple pets, and he plays the guitar in what he calls an old man ma- <laughs> That's actually kind of hard to say. An old man band. And the band's name is El Cheapo. Chuck is also the author of six screenplays. While in Los Angeles, he was a production assistant on TV commercials, a few indie movies, and music videos. Sounds like a cool gig. He was hired at How Stuff Works after a friend got a job there and submitted the first act of a screenplay as his writing sample for his job application. Adorable. On October 31st of 2017, Chuck Bryant started a podcast called Movie Crush to converse with celebrities about their favorite movies. So if you like what you're hearing from Stuff You Should Know and want a little bit more Chuck in your life, feel free to check out Movie Crush. For your sneak peek in this Meet the Talent section, I've decided to include the end of one of their episodes, which is a listener mail section, so y'all will get a chance to listen to what that sounds like. And after hearing a little bit more from Chuck and Josh, I will dive into all of the fun facts I have gathered about Mr. Josh Clark. Uh, if you want to know more about the Dietlov Pass incident, you can type those words into, uh, well, the internet, and it'll give you all sorts of crazy stuff. And since I said that, it's time for listener mail. 
All right, so this one is a bit long, but this is a Josh request. Oh, this one's good. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. And this is from Corey in Joyzy City. Uh, hey, guys, at the open of your recent episode on tsunamis, you both expressed disbelief that the topic had never been covered. In fact, you guys both said you could have sworn you'd already covered it, and you each went back multiple times to check. Even after checking three times, you both admitted to being quote, paranoid, end quote, that it had somehow been done before. And just like you guys, I was surprised to find out it had never been covered and began to wonder why I had fuzzy memories. Mm -hmm. So I did a little digging, re-listening to old episodes on similar topics. It turns out the three of us are not the only ones convinced of this existent uh, episode, the existence of this episode. Apparently, the 2014 episode of uh, Stuff You Should Know, Josh and Chuck also believed in the existence. In the Rogue Waves episode, right? Correct. Uh, yes. In the September tw uh, 2014 show about Rogue Waves at about 28 minutes in, Chuck says, and I'll do this as Chuck. Okay. One of the last things we should cover, Josh, is the difference between Rogue Waves and Tsunamis. But we've already done an episode on Tsunamis. And that, Josh, was a that was a great chunk. <laughs> I appreciate that. I've been working on it. Uh, and at this point, Josh chimes in to confirm the existence. You want to confirm it as Josh? Uh, my name is Josh, and I'm confirming the existence of that episode, <laughs> I think is what I said roughly. I think so. And you guys go on to cover the topic quickly, seemingly in agreement that uh, an in-depth explanation isn't necessary since it already existed. Man. This opens the door to many questions, guys. Did any listeners write in after Rogue Waves to ask where the tsunami episode was? Uh, Corey, I don't remember. I don't either. Surely with so many listeners who take pride in having listened to every episode of the show, someone should have noticed. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, why were you guys so convinced of the existence of the tsunami episode in 2014? I don't know, Corey. Wouldn't Jerry notice? No. Well, that's a no. <laughs> in case that was at all confusing... That excerpt was Josh and Chuck doing impressions of themselves. So when Josh was talking about Josh, that was Josh speaking. And when Chuck was talking about Chuck and doing his impersonation of Chuck, that was Chuck talking. Hopefully that wasn't confusing and hopefully I didn't just confuse you more. And if you're wondering who Jerry is, I'll get to her at the end. But right now we're going to talk about Josh. Josh Malcolm Clark was born July 15th, 1976, making him a cancer. He grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and was raised Catholic, attended Catholic school, and moved to Marietta, Georgia as a teenager. Josh's father's name is Mal, and he was an HVAC engineer. Josh also had a sister named Karen, who unfortunately died in 1992 in a car accident when Josh was about 16 years old. He also has two brothers-in-law, one of whom also happens to be named Josh. He attended Sprayberry High School and studied history and anthropology at the University of Georgia. As a young boy interested in the paranormal, Josh initially wanted to study parapsychology at Duke University. Also, as a child, he was an avid reader of Uncle John's Bathroom Reader, as mentioned in many of the podcast episodes, and he jokingly cites Uncle John's Bathroom Reader as the source of the majority of his knowledge. Josh is a former smoker, drinks a lot of coffee, and is an amateur mixologist, which means he fancies himself a bartender. Josh is also a fan of Firefly, Dollywood, Quentin Tarantino, and The Simpsons, which he frequently references and quotes on SYSK. Before joining How Stuff Works in 2007, he held many jobs, including a paper route, washing dogs, and, quote, jobs that involve shovels, end quote. Before recording his first episode in 2008, Josh had never listened to a podcast and didn't even know what one was. AP, double AP would have been perfect for him. Too bad I was 13 in 2008 and tragically unaware of podcasts myself. Probably preoccupied with middle school politics too. But here we are now. On August 13th of 2011, Josh Clark proposed to his then girlfriend Umi, who is six years, or sorry, six months younger than him, and the couple have been married ever since. On November 7th of 2018, Josh Clark created his own podcast solo project called The End of the World with Josh Clark. As a final fun fact about both Josh and Chuck, they both pee sitting down. And as a trans guy, it's important for me to let you know that it's important to normalize all men sitting to pee because who cares how you pee 
And if you care about how Josh and Chuck pee, there you go. They pee sitting down. This has been a PSA. Now you can put your hold about Jerry on pause or off pause, I guess I should say, because I'm about to tell you all I know about her, which isn't very much. We don't know a lot about her because she never speaks on mic. She's the producer of Stuff You Should Know. She's a miso aficionado, as in miso soup. And I also know that she minored in Russian studies in college. But as she never speaks directly in any episodes and is only ever referenced to or mentioned, we don't necessarily know that she exists for real, for real. I mean, obviously she probably does. They mention when she's on a leave of absence or on vacation, etc. Me here at APAAP, I'm a one man show for now anyway. But for Jerry, she's probably the glue that holds the magic of Chuck and Josh together. She's just the kind of glue you don't see. Invisible glue. So that's all I know about Jerry, the unofficial babysitter official producer of Stuff You Should Know. That guitar riff means it's time for why it's worth it. And man, oh man, am I going to try to be concise. The show's scope of topics begins to boggle the brain, and the fact that it's research-driven is one of the things I love most about it. Oftentimes, they will even cite where they're getting their information from, although not all the time, which we'll get into in Room for Improvement. However, the information and advice contained within many of these episodes is really pertinent to real life and can be critical. There was a listener mail where somebody wrote in, had a cousin struggling with symptoms, and after listening to SYSK's episode on hookworm, the listener forwarded that episode to their cousin and was all, yo, do you think this might be what you have? And as a result, appropriate medical treatment was obtained. Talk about real world relevance, even into your personal life, am I right? Any one of us could help out a cousin with hookworm simply by listening and learning from stuff you should know. Not to mention, you'll be excellent at playing Trivial Pursuit as well as yelling answers at your TV whilst playing along to Jeopardy. Another quirky thing I've come to find is these guys can either find something interesting or make something interesting out of nearly any subject. I challenge you to pick an episode about a topic you know nothing about, or even better, pick an upload you strongly suspect will be boring. I predict SYSK will have a peculiar way of thwarting that expectation, and instead you will find yourself surprisingly entertained and thoroughly informed. The show is peppered with self-referential and inside jokes to reward longtime listeners. One example, a classic, is their Wayback Machine, which comes complete with its own sound effect and everything, and is used for time-traveling purposes when discussing historical stuff. Another running joke is the pair's ongoing collection of unexpected band names, which have been inspired by various phrases throughout their gigantic catalog of content. Some of my personal favorites include Tub of Pulp, Medieval Synthesis, Nuclear Bulge, Damage Night, and Jungle X-Ray. Oh man, I would listen to that playlist day and night, are you kidding me? The tip of the top of the crop, in my opinion, is the Electric Death Commission, which just sounds rad, man. I would listen to that band all the time, in my ears, every day. On the flip side, these professionals know how to be tactful and respectful when discussing difficult topics. Listen here to an excerpt of Josh and Chuck from SYSK's episode on how rape kits work to see what I mean. I would imagine, uh, ask if you want to be tested. Sure. Uh, they will offer um, emergency contraception yeah. as well. And you're not going to be charged for that procedure or the kit. Here's the thing. Go, go or, on. or you shouldn't be. No, you won't be. Not for the not for the 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 administration of the kit. Right. Which is that's great. That's substantial. I mean, it's a sixteen dollar kit, but this is also four or five hours of an ER nurse's right. p- potentially a highly trained ER nurse's time. So that's great. They're not charging you. But what's uh, what's a shame? What's shameful? I should say, is that you will still be charged for any treatment of injuries. Say right. like you um you were. were 
or hit and you need to be treated with right. like stitches or whatever, you'll get a bill for stitches. Yeah. If you say, yes, I do want antiviral drugs because I'm afraid of having contracted an STD or I do want emergency contraception, they'll say, here's your prescription and the pharmacist will charge you for that. Yeah. That's not okay. As a society, we should not ask rape and sexual assault victims to pay for their own medical treatment right. directly coming from a, a rape or a sexual assault. We should bear that burden ourselves, and then it should give us that even slighter additional incentive to go get the guy who did it. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. We should, nobody should pay a cent. And then even worse than that, and I'm sorry, I realize I'm standing on a pretty big soapbox right now, but worse than that, Chuck, prior to the Affordable Care Act, you could not you, you you it was possible that you would be denied future um health care coverage insurance if you were the victim of a sexual assault or rape um who went to go get treatment yeah because they treated it as a pre-existing condition unbelievable a pre-existing condition was rape can you believe that uh sadly i can no, right, step down. <laughs> um, the, they're going to take this kit. They're going to seal everything up. They're going to store it. Um, everything is like, you know, all the clothing and everything and all the swabs are dried out and labeled. And um, then it's sealed back in that original box as part of the... Um, I guess the genius of this kit mm -hmm. was that everything that comes out of it goes right back in, and mm -hmm. it is also the storage device right? Uh, where it's, you know, labeled. And then it's all uh, shipped to local law enforcement, and then it's stored um, quite possibly till the end of time, sadly. Uh, yeah. Or destroyed. We'll yeah. get to both of those things. Other strengths of the show include how strategic they are with their disclaimers and COAs, not for fear of retribution, but in an attempt to be as politically correct as possible in order to alienate the least amount of listeners. I also admire their willingness to get vulnerable and share personal stories, opinions, and experiences during these episodes, responsibly qualifying these statements as anecdotal. The show happens to be extremely open to correction as well, which is one way they often engage with their diverse community via that listener mail section at the end of every upload. Lastly, the audio quality is top-notch with thoughtful yet minimalistic sound design. I love their various music transitions, which are all a riff or remix of their main SYSK melody, which I feel like lends a nice consistency as well as uniqueness to each topic because oftentimes the genre of the music seems paired in a complementary way to whatever the subject they happen to be speaking on. That about wraps it up for why it's worth it. Now I'll jump into Room for Improvement, which is going to open with your final sneak peek. Room for Improvement. All right. So where are they? They're on the Mountain of the Dead, which I don't believe we mentioned was the uh, was the translation that the local indigenous tribe, the Monsi tribe, called this mountain. Kolatsyakal. The Mountain of the Dead. And the Monsi tribe um, will will pop up later in theories. Mm -hmm. So just we're putting pins in things. Do you remember <laughs> in our Magic Mushroom episode where we talked about like um, reindeer herder who would feed their reindeer mushrooms and then drink the pee to trip themselves? I think I do remember that. That's the Monsi. Oh. They're like Siberian... Um, nomads i believe wow who, and, and who know how to party yeah and uh, like the the magic mushrooms that their shame their shamans eat and probably their their regular people eat too uh -huh. they're very toxic um and one way to get rid of the toxins is to feed them to reindeer and the oh. reindeer the reindeer's yeah, kidneys filter that. out the toxins and you drink the reindeer pee and the psychoactive stuff is still present in their pee wow yeah and they think that possibly I'm saving this for the Christmas episode. Okay. <laughs> okay. So go ahead. I'm sorry. But that's the Monty people. For this Room for Improvement section, I needed a little help. So I actually made a post on the SYSK Army Facebook group to ask them, A, what some of their favorite episodes were as I was perusing this massive catalog and trying to find sneak peeks that would be good examples for the show. And I asked what suggestions, if any, they may have for how Stuff You Should Know could be better. And this is a top-notch podcast, so there's not a whole lot of room for improvement. However, the two recurring complaints, if you want to call them that, that 
were cited were mispronunciations and tangents. So that's where this example comes that I selected for Room for Improvement is this tangent completely distracts me. I mean, the episode itself is about this mystery that happened in Dyatlov Pass, and yet they start talking about psychedelic reindeer piss, and my mind goes elsewhere. For those who have longer attention spans than me, maybe this wouldn't be a problem for you, and I would admit that these tangents, they are entertaining. Like, I'm not denying that. In a lot of ways, it adds much of the character to the show. So the tangents were pretty divided when it comes to the Facebook group. A lot of people mentioned that maybe that was an area for improvement. A lot of folks defended the tangents. So depends on your preference, I suppose. But that was one recurring thing people mentioned. And mispronunciations. I mean, pronouncing stuff is hard. Last names, foreign words. So you got to cut Chuck and Josh some slack. Everybody's human after all. And they do the best that they can. And I don't know. I'm impressed by it most of the time. Another thing that I would suggest as a room for improvement and something they're self-aware about is occasionally they talk around their subject without specifically defining what it actually is. How they may consider a topic, discuss its history, significance, and relevance, and somehow neglect to provide a simple, clear definition, which in some cases may not be necessary given your prior knowledge, but everyone is coming from a different worldview. And for a podcast about stuff you should know, I mean, making sure you have that clear definition of what your subject matter is, fairly important. There are times where the humor may fly under one's radar, and that has a danger of misinterpreting a joke as a fact. This usually occurs as a result of Josh's unperturbed, impenetrable deadpan, which, if not for Chuck's clarifying giggles, might confuse a casual listener. It's easier to catch on to over time, and it adds to the funny, but... It can be irresponsible if you consider how conveying accurate information should be the most paramount thing. I feel like a buzzkill just saying that, though. It was something also acknowledged in a fairly recent episode of theirs, too. So we all have our pitfalls. And again, these are minor weaknesses and add to the character of the show overall. Incidentally, they have twice repeated a topic. They revisited the topic of Murphy's Law in 2011 after first doing it in 2008, probably because it was one of their first episodes and it was under six minutes long in that first run. So I think they kind of just did it again and bolstered it up a bit. They also accidentally repeated a podcast on customs, producing the first episode in 2010 and the second in 2016. That also reminds me, they have repetitions in the editing, which like the audio cuts back in time and jumps back replaying a segment of the same audio. It makes you think that your pocket pressed the skip button on you, but I've noticed it happen to me in multiple episodes, even when my phone is just propped up on the desk next to me, untouched on the table. So I think that that is an editing snafu that happens on occasion. So something to improve upon if possible. Welcome to the Peanut Gallery, aka the last segment of our show today. I teased at the beginning that my dad would be joining me to talk about stuff you should know, and that is what I have in store. This interview was recorded on Father's Day, so that is why I wish my dad a happy Father's Day. I love my dad very much. He's a huge supporter of this show, and he's the reason I am the man that I am today. So I appreciate y'all listening in on his two cents on stuff you should know. And here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, the voice actor behind the trailer of A Pod About A Pod. Hi, my name is John Bagley, and I'm Jordan's dad, and it's almost Father's Day. Thanks for having me, Jordan. Of course. Thanks for joining me, Dad. Um, I know that you and your girlfriend, Doreen, are some of my biggest fans here at A Pod About A Pod, so I always appreciate the support. And I only have a couple questions here for you. Shouldn't take too long, hopefully. So the first one that I wanted to ask is, Tell us a little bit about like your relationship to podcasting and like SYSK in particular. Well, it was you pretty much who told me about podcasts and, uh, and actually it was when I took a little trip out to Death Valley a few months ago and you had suggested a couple. Um, this one, this podcast being one of them and um, lost 
cell phone reception a little ways out there. And for whatever reason, I was able to listen to the pods. And so I listened for about three hours straight to various ones. So I'm like, man, Jordan's onto something here. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in your opinion, what do you think makes stuff you should know worth the listen? Like what kind of hooked you after you finally took the plunge and decided to trust me and that I knew what I was talking about? <laughs> well, you know, I'm kind of a history guy. You know, I like reading uh, historical fiction and that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, history is win- uh, written by the victors, they always say. And so we're not necessarily getting the truth all the time. We're just getting, uh, you know, whoever wrote that book and whoever's on the right side of the law or history is the one writing it. So I kind of like this one because, you know, um, you kind of get a more unbiased view, I think, about current events or just stuff that you should know. And uh, they kind of break it down real basic for you. And it's just really interesting, kind of captures your interest right away. Yeah, I agree. So that being said, like, are there any specific favorite episodes that you've come across so far? Well, there's a couple, and I wish I'd paid attention more, uh, you know, so I could tell you the actual title of the episode. Uh, but there's one where they talked about an accident that happened off of an oil rig where they were transferring um, work personnel like a couple miles underneath the ocean, and someone did something wrong, and they had the gas compression wrong. And basically, it caused, um, you know, a big, not an explosion, but... It sucked this guy's whole body completely through the chamber, a door, you know, that was an eight, eighth of an inch thin. Just Oh, man. Just sucked his whole body right through it. Obviously killed him instantly. But that was just kind of a weird, like, what is this? And like you said, you learn all kinds of interesting facts about how they transfer the people that I listened two to, miles beneath um, the sea and how dangerous before. it is. And then we just made a revisit in this case. The other day, when guy, Doreen and I were out. driving up to Idlewild, was, um, you know, about the... Um, massacre black wall street and again something i've never heard of and now that it's making the rounds i think 60 minutes actually did a story on it this sunday uh with the black lives matter movement uh it's really topical and can trace their rage just that much more accurately because you know like 150 200 people were just slaughtered uh you know for really no reason other than racism and bigotry. So, uh, you know, that was real topical too. You know, history repeats itself. And so when you hear, hear that kind of stuff, uh, it just makes you realize we got a long way to go. Final question. Uh, SYSK is obviously a very polished podcast. They've been doing it for a really long time. Um, it's funny, I even asked the Facebook group that's like the fan group of Stuff You Should Know. I polled all of them to get some of their favorite episodes so I had somewhere to start in their massive catalog and trying to find my sneak peeks, as well as if they had any ideas on how to improve the show. And so I want to pose that question to you. Again, they're you know quite polished and they're pretty professional in everything they do, but I like to think that you know nobody is outside of some room for improvement. So is there anything that you have heard in your time listening to them that you might suggest to change or anything like that? Well, I'm still kind of a newbie to the whole podcast thing. So for me to um, poke at them might not be appropriate. You know, I would say probably that they don't necessarily quote some of their sources or where they got some of their information, which might be helpful uh, to old guys like me who tend to be a little cynical or, you know, there's that balance. Like you're saying, I, I like that the podcast is there as a new medium to get information, but just like all information mediums, it's like, okay, just cause you said it didn't make it true or just cause you read it didn't make it true. So probably that would be the only thing. I don't remember them really quoting too much on where they found their information. And I know it's mm-hmm. supposed to be payment, not a bibliography, but there might be some middle ground there that could be explored. Yeah, very valid. I appreciate that comment. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Dad. Um, I thought that this was, you know, a great podcast to feature for Father's Day just because, you know, it's kind of a couple old dudes shooting the shit about stuff (laughs) they find interesting. And I don't know, it seems like a very dad podcast to me. So I thought of you, of course, and hopefully some dads out there who might be listening are going to give stuff you should know a try. Well, and I've given other podcasts that you feature to try. Um, You know, it's a real helpful service to someone like me who doesn't want to spend hours uh, plundering around. I'd rather hear about it from you. And then, so that sounds cool and check it out. So it's a good service, Joe. 
Well, thank you very much, Dad. I love you. Happy Father's Day. Thanks again for being on the show. And I uh, look forward to, you know, sending it out to you so you can hear it. All right. I appreciate it, Joe. Love you. All right. Love you. Have a good day. As always, thank you for joining me on another episode in my quest to find and share the best of podcasts. Email us at apodaboutapod at gmail.com with whatever's on your mind, especially if it's a suggestion for a show you think deserves a feature on APAAP. Finally, the last reason this episode, our eighth episode, was called the Summer Holiday Special is because not only was yesterday the 4th of July... I will also be on vacation for the next two weeks, which means our next episode is slated for July 26th. The best way not to miss me too much is to follow a pod about a pod on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So until then, happy listening. <laughs>